more complicated, you know, man. It's like a damn Rubik's Cube, man. You like talking about that blue red, man. Then you get to one side, then you like the rest of it. All right, Academic Agent, welcome to the Jay Burden Show. How you doing? Very good. Thanks for having me. I've been enjoying your show. Oh, thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm glad to have you on. So a little bit of background uh, for anyone who, who doesn't know. I, I brought you on to discuss education, and it's based off of a conversation that you know, first you and, and, and Patrick had on his show, which was quite good. I actually found his show because you, know, you booked him and I on a, on a show, and so I you know, found his content and enjoyed it quite a lot. And, and you talked about education. Obviously, you, know, you are an academic. And, and from that, you were talking about I guess the trivium and how things like the trivium are no longer taught. So if you could, could you define, I guess, the trivium and contrast the more traditional way of education with what we see in more modern schools? And I realize that's an incredibly broad question, but, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, take whatever piece of it you want to. Sure. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll just say very quickly, uh, Jay, that, uh, the academic agency, you can find it if you Google it or on my channel or whatever. Um, I do have a sale on at the moment. Um, which is, if you use the promo code MERIT, it'll get you 25% off everything, including uh, all the bundles, the Trivium itself, individual courses, etc. So, um, you know, if people are interested to take it themselves, uh, you know, it's available there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, um, really, uh, what the Trivium uh, gives you and what I've been trying to provide, uh, at least on the courses that I've uh, done on the academic agency, is a fully redic- is a fully rounded education in what you might have called historically the humanities. Have you come across, uh, like when you, were do- you, when you were in college, Jay, did they say that you were doing a humanities degree or did they use that yes, term? Yes, yeah, that, dis- that's the, that distinction is still made. Yeah, so, and... Um, can I put this? Uh, the way the way that education has gone, especially at university level, is uh, the emphasis on independent thought, the ability to make arguments, to pass the arguments of other people, to critically analyze the arguments of others using logic and evidence. Uh, you know, th- th- these are all. Uh, these are all the kind of nuts and bolts of what I would consider to be just fundamental skills in education. Um, And then even before you get to that, which requires, um, you know, logic and and, and research, of course, which is another another course uh, I've done, Foundations of Research. Um, Even before you get to that, you need to be able to uh, clearly articulate those arguments using plain legible English um, and 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 again um, this is something that I, is there, I, I think there's a tendency for the oh I think we've lost him hopefully he'll come back soon oh. can, can you hear me yeah, you just roboted for a little bit. Uh, you said uh, the last phrase I heard was, I think there's uh, a tendency to, and then it cut uh, out. Uh, let me close Microsoft Word, tell you what. It's probably oh, sure. uh, it's probably the book I'm writing, slowing down my system. I'll close Telegram as well. Um, so, yeah, um, the uh, there's a tendency on our side of things, I think on the right, to act as if all schools and all universities are now worthless, right? That all education currently on offer it isn't, you know, isn't worth it. Um, I don't actually agree with that. I still think there are good colleges, there are good schools, there are good, still good universities. And even in bad ones, there are still good individuals working, you know, uh, like me for a couple of years ago, you know, um, there, are st- there are still lots of good people in the education system. But as a general tendency, I would say, these core skills of being able to, to write legible, sentences, being able to pass arguments using reason, logic, evidence, uh, being able to, to research topic inside and out. Um, and then one that is, to my knowledge, very seldom talk, 
talked about or taught anywhere. The ability to spot the tricks of rhetoric, just just the um, just the kind of I mean, once upon a time they would have, they would have called them, um, you know, the the tricks of sophism or something like that. Um, I don't know if that's taught anywhere, apart from maybe where you went to school, uh, Jay. Um, you know, um, and and of course th these persuasion tricks are everywhere in our culture. Uh, you know, in advertising, uh, on the news, increasingly. Uh, you know, things uh, said by politicians. And, um, you know, we complain about the high incidence of NPCs, right, in, in, our, in our culture, in our society. People who just accept the word of authority lying down. You know, you've all seen the memes of the, the chips being updated, right? Uh, I mean, we lived through COVID and we lived through uh, BLM and so many other, you know, insane things that have happened over the past few years. And there are individuals who followed every single narrative without pausing for breath, right? Um, part of the reason I would say that uh, there's, there are such high incidences of that is, is because these things are no longer taught, uh, especially... Uh, the the ability to spot a fallacious argument to you know understand that this person's making an appeal to to emotions this person is making a, an appeal to authority or whatever, or whatever else um so yeah i mean that is really what made me want to uh write the trivium um uh, among among some of the other courses that i've done so that's insightful. If you could, could you define what the trivium is? Yeah. So, so, so the trivium is, um, is a, uh, it's a, well, historically it was grammar, right? Grammar, uh, logic and rhetoric. And for most of history, uh, and I'm talking about from the time of Plato and Aristotle all the way until I would say about the 1950s, uh, it was part of the standard um, curriculum, st standard uh, education that children would have received. Um, and I think that most kids would have done it by the time they were 12. Um, I actually came, I actually got really interested in it myself, um, studying Shakespeare's education. I don't know if you know much about Shakespeare, but he famously left school at the age of 12. His um, his grandfather, his father uh, was a man called John Shakespeare. He was a glover. And around the time Shakespeare was 12, he had a, he had a kind of financial setback. Something happened. And Shakespeare, who, who would have been um, paying, a, you know, some nominal fees to go to, uh, you know, a, a boys grammar school in Stratford where he grew up, uh, he was pulled out of school to help with his with his father's business um yet by the time he finished you know uh, when he was pulled out he would have already done um the the classical trivium he would have already completed uh you know his writing and grammar courses uh he would have learned um uh you know logic and rhetoric but they also did a number of other things as well, another number of other classes. Obviously, they learned some Latin and Greek and so on. But um, one of the things they did was called classical imitatio. I don't know if you've come across this, where, um, you, know, you know, as school children, they would be tasked with embodying the arguments of another person, right? So um, Probably the best example of this is uh, Plato's dialogues, right, where he has Socrates making arguments, but also many other people are in the forum making arguments. Um, and in, in Shakespeare's time, school kids and didn't necessarily have to come from a particularly well-off family. Um, many parishes and churches would, would offer this for relatively small sums of money. I, I think, I think, Today, there's a tendency to think that for most of history, you know, everybody was just illiterate, stupid peasants, right? It's not not actually the case. Uh, you could actually have 
relatively decent education from fairly humble background for for, for a lot of European history. Um, well, anyway, uh, in uh, Shakespeare's time, they did this thing called imitatio, where you know you you have to put your own personal views and your own personal prejudices out of mind to embody the point of view of another human being, right? And argue from hence, argue from, and anybody who's who's done um, debate club in school would maybe would recognise some of these exercises they used to do, um, and and this is one of the things that I I always that always fascinated me about Shakespeare is that you could read one of his plays, and he was so good at doing this. He had such a natural capacity to embody the point of view of another person. That you could reach the end of the play and you just wouldn't know what side he was on. You'd be like, wow, was he so is he on the side of the Lancastrians or the Orcus? I don't know. Is he uh is he with the rebels or is he, you know, or you know, in, in something like the Merchant of Venice, like does is he an anti Semite, this guy, or does does he actually have sympathy with Shylock, you know? And mountains of books have been written on these sorts of debates because Shakespeare was I mean, if you ask me, uh, you know, in the case of Merchant of Venice, for example, I think that Shakespeare is not on the side of Shylock. I think he's against Shylock, as most people in his day and age would have been. But he still gives Shylock this extraordinary speech, you know, hath not a GYs, you know, um, do we not bleed like you? I mean, it's just, just an incredible human speech that this Jewish character gives uh, in the middle of this Renaissance play. And it's so powerful that, you know, you can actually read the play both ways, and there have been whole books written about how actually his sympathy is on the other side. Um, and to me, that that's just, uh, they, they call that Shakespeare's negative capability. Uh, I think John Keats called it that. Um, and I just think that there's a sophistication to that, and there's a, there's a level of human empathy to, to that that is entirely missing in our discourse today, in our political discourse today. Um, for example, do you think you could take your typical progressive, right, and ask them to do the classical imitatio for the arguments of, I don't know, Steve Bannon or something? Like, no, you, you know, of course not. And yeah, with, is... Without calling him a fascist, without calling him names, could they actually just summarize what Steve Bannon's arguments are, period? Well, and it's actually, I think a big part of this is you see this in kind of the the low quality kind of like boomer liberal political cartoons. Like these are the kind of things that you find in you know, places like Newsweek or the Wall Street Journal, like more establishment newspapers. And I remember even as a kid looking at these cartoons and there's a couple cartoonists. It's like the left wing version of Ben Garrison, but not quite so uh, not quite so unhinged. But you look at it and in in every case, they cannot they cannot. I guess, put themselves in the place of their opposition so that they assume that, and, and you see this very much in kind of like the psychologizing of the right, that the only reason you could disagree with me is the reasons I have given, to, or like I have, I would assume, which is essentially that you are like morally and psychologically broken as a person. You know, so you see this a lot in, you know, in media as well. It, with characters, and I know that, you know, Morgoth and Endeavor just did a recent video on, on Watchmen, and, and Moore is by no means a, you know, a traditionalist or conservative at all. He's a pretty left-wing guy. And to a certain extent, I think he almost doesn't realize, and I'm using him as a stand-in because I, I mm -hmm. agree with your point, that the character of Rorschach, he, you can tell that he's obviously written to be a monster, but he's also, from a certain perspective, the only kind of like upstanding person in the whole thing, despite all of the like, like he is written to be terrible, but in even somewhat faithfully, I guess, trying to represent the ideas of his opponent, it almost kind of ties himself in knots. And so I think that you see people even kind of at a, you know, a pre-rational level anticipating that. And so just substituting, you know, their own kind of truly like bigoted opinions and so to get back to your original point, I think that that's a skill that's completely lost. The ability to, you know, set aside your own personal, I guess, feelings about something and really say like, all right, well, if I was, if I was Steve Bannon, 
if I was the shit lip, here's how I would feel and here's how I would act. And I think that obviously there's a trap in, in empathy, you know, and just kind of like endlessly hand wringing about well, what do they feel? What do they think? Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, right. There is truth to the idea that you, if you don't understand something, it's much, much harder to defeat it. You know, and I, and I look like I am, especially when it comes to a lot of the gender stuff, fully okay with using terms like, you know, demonic and satanic for someone who really does want that level of, you know, unbridled personal autonomy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, just calling everyone you don't like a demon, that's not particularly productive. You know, that really is just kind of like a cheap rhetorical trick to say, oh, you're the worst. And mm -hmm. so I, I, I very much see what you're getting at. Yeah, I mean, I mean, part of my concern is that, um, I mean, okay, I, I use the example of a, of, a, of a progressive, but I see this on all. St I don't necessarily think this is a left or right thing. I think it's just an aspect of human nature that you need to, um, and in order to be able to do what we've been talking about, you actually have to cultivate it as a good habit. You know, like Aristotle talked about good habit, cultivating good habits. Um, if you're not used to, if you get out of the habit of being able to pass other people's arguments, uh, pick them apart and so on, um, it's um, it's possible then to 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 lapse into some very bad habits. Um, and I'll I'll just give you a couple of examples. That I I've, I'm not going to mention any names here, but uh, I've just I kind of see it here and there. You know, there's a there's a substack culture now of people making written arguments, so it's kind of easier to see. Um, but there's this tendency of there's this tendency of all people, not not just leftists, to kind of move past the argument, right, and um, to start attacking other things. I mean, the most obvious the most obvious uh, the most obvious example of that is the ad is the ad hominem, right? You attack the argument, you, so you attack the man and not the argument. But this comes out in all sorts of hidden and insidious ways. Um, one of the things I've talked about before is the is the liberal need to psychologize, right? To psychologize, and you see this all the time when you hit upon things that people don't want to acquiesce to, right? They will immediately reach for a psychoanalytic or psychological explanation for why you've come up with that argument that attacks the person and not the thing itself. Um, th th this is this is in fact um, something that uh, happened all through the 20th century, where there was this shift from text, looking at the argument, looking at the actual words on the page, to subtext. What's not there? And let's talk about that, right? And and this is what makes a lot of the the kind of uh, the Marxist stuff, the feminist stuff, and so on so um toxic in a way because you invariably end up talking about something else right something that's not even there um well it reminds me very yeah. much of a scene in in pilgrim's regress which is one of c.s lewis's earlier works and it's kind of a retelling of you know obviously the the famous uh you know the famous pilgrim's progress and and in his kind of version of this he when he is in when held in prison by the giant uh, you know, kind of aping the scene from the original, the giant is, is Freud. And what the giant does is whenever the giant looks at you, you can kind of see below your skin, your skin becomes translucent. And, and so the, the author basically describes how all of a sudden everyone is like hideous and revolting, these like pulsing sacks of, of meat. And, and eventually he's, he's rescued from this. And I think the point that he's making is that obviously there's something to be said in psychological analysis, right? But that's not only not the only level of analysis, but it becomes paralyzing. And look, I'm sure you've read these. I, I have kind of a, a guilty pleasure of, you know, whenever I was in school and lazy professors would make us read, you know, each other's work to kind of pre-grade it or, you know, having friends who are professors or adjuncts. I love reading terrible undergrad essays. They're all, I mean, it's, it's like, it's grim stuff, but it is kind of funny. And, and yeah. it's not even... These I've ideas. got so many flashbacks just now, Jay. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I'll just I'll just tell you my favorite one. Um, Shakespeare lived in the Victorian age. Oh. <laughs> First sentence. <laughs> Bagby, when he was a, a grad student, he has a whole file of these. And he had an entire essay about 
uh, Robert E. Lee as the prime example of a Southern genital man, a misspelling <laughs> of gentle <laughs> throughout an entire essay. But th the point is, again, and you see these ideas, like you've said, this kind of like I urge to kind of pathologize and psychologize that in many in many ways, I don't think people even rationally understand but that kind of like and it's a frustrating mode of analysis because it is it's just it's like acid it eats away at everything and if you go into if you go into any form of media through this kind of like obsessive compulsive you know like look at the you know look at the author look at these kind of like hidden assumptions you really do almost completely miss the forest for the trees and obviously <clears throat> you know in some men's life their biography is kind of important. Like I think of, of figures like Mishima, you know, his work is good. And, but yet his biography is kind of integral to understanding, you know, who he is and why he wrote, but it, it is, it is paralyzing at least how I see it, but I, I interrupted you carry on. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and, and then one of the more, one of the more uh, pernicious things that happened um, is, is that this psychologizing then, is uh is then used in a positive way i don't mean that by i don't mean that as in like a positive a good thing i mean it we, we've been talking about it in a negative sense right i'm talking about it now being inserted into actual texts um i mean the example i've always given is uh the uh the tim burton willy wonka right where where now this uh kind of any any enigmatic uh Kind of imaginative figure, Willy Wonka, is explained by the fact he's got an evil dentist dad, right? Um, and I, I, I haven't watched it, but I believe that Disney have remade Pinocchio recently, and in the remade version, you know, we we, we discover that um, Pinocchio actually was the victim of like intense bullying and things like this, and it's like the entire sense of what that text was, of what it meant. Of what, of what, you know, of why it was um, kind of embodied in narrative form and handed down the generations has now been subverted, right? Because you're you're now kind of injecting this subtextual reason for the narrative, which wasn't there before. It'd be like, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it'd be like going back and trying to like, I don't know, you could pick your favorite story and rewrite it with a psychological explanation in it. So it, it actually has a has a really corrosive cultural effect as well once they start rewriting narratives with these analyses kind of built in and put front and center. So, well, um, it, yeah. it reminds me very much of a point that Bowden makes in Pulp Fascism, where he's talking about, you know, why do people find, you know, the villains in these older stories so appealing? And well, really it's because they're just evil, you know, they're just bad guys. You know, there's not this kind of like need to make every form of evil, this kind of like misunderstanding. And to me, I, I feel like it is a kind of a, an inherently liberal bias in the sense that it's this idea that, well, there is no evil that comes from the human spirit. You know, there is no evil that is inherent to us. Evil is a medical condition where it's a, it's socioeconomic circumstances, you know, to take mm -hmm. another line. And it's not only untrue, but it just hamstrings any type of real analysis. Because one of the things that I, I truly love about a, a liberal education, again, using liberal in a different sense here, is that you kind of, you can become a part of this you know, rich tapestry of conversation. And if you're just sitting in the front like a pedant saying, well, oh, that's just the author's, you know, thinly veiled such and such or, you know, childhood trauma, or really we should be rereading this character as X, Y, Z. It's mm -hmm. you've essentially you've, you've completely disregarded and sidestepped the entire conversation, you know, and look like I'm all for like, I, I really do enjoy low quality films. You know, I, I'm a, a big fan of the Wesley Snipes Blade movies. Like I, I like that kind of like schlocky garbage. But there's this culture that's grown up, especially on the internet, of kind of it's like pointless nitpicking. You know, the, the kind of like image board culture of like, oh, well, do you know that Jack and Rose could have fit on that piece of furniture at the end of Titanic? I'm not defending the movie, but 
I think we have mm -hmm. to own that that kind of like just nitpicking and and pedantry is it's something we've all absorbed to a certain point. Yeah, I, I was going to say as well they 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 do it on the flip side. So they they do it for evil, but they also do it for good as well. Um, they they always need to provide some sort of rationale for like some sort of material rationale for any sort of positive action that anybody does um which uh which again is like highly corrosive um probably probably the best example um in in recent times has been political right where they they must explain away the likes of a Donald Trump or Brexit or something as you know in in as an economic phenomenon right the cry of the dispossessed or some something like this right where it's like well um you know many of these people just want their country back like i the, the reason the reasons for what the reasons that are being provided are not actually the reasons that people say and this is again the problem of subtext because all of their mental moves basically work towards you never actually encountering the words of the people themselves um the ur case of this of course is the mid-century Germans. Like our entire system is designed so you that you never read any of the mid-century Germans in their own words, right? You're just told what motivated them, right? It was kind of economic depression. It was, you know, that's how people got brainwashed. And then, you know, the um they use kind of sinister propaganda techniques, but they were just motivated by by hate, basically. That, that, that was it. Uh so you don't actually encounter their actual arguments. But they do that with everything, whether it's Vladimir Putin or, you know, Nigel Farage even. You know, if you live within that liberal bubble, you only ever get the third-hand, already subtextualized, caricatured version of the thing. Um, so that you never actually... And, I, I mean, I remember a few years ago, uh, it's going to going way back now, but do you remember when like Sargon and PJW and all those sorts of guys, they did that protest where they had that tape around their mouth? That, you know, it was like a free speech thing. And they had the oh, tape. yes. That, that's an old motif, but yeah, I do remember that. Well, well, that, that tape around the mouth thing is essentially what they do to everything. Um, it, 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 it's, it's a very uh, kind of all-encompassing thing, but they don't even have to go to the trouble of censoring most of the time because they have people in a mental prison where they actually the, the, the voices of any of any alternative point of view are already silenced and kind of they're, they're kind of beyond the pale ready right um and and and, and that is something that um you cannot really overcome unless you um kind of develop the mental habits that i've been talking about you can't i like i mean in order to think well right uh how am i going to get to the truth of this you have to first of all ignore all of that and go to back to the source material which takes some research skills right like if i uh, how are you going to find like the speeches of goebbels right um and then if you are going to find them how do you find the right edition that hasn't been like doctored and then when you do encounter the speeches of Goebbels, how do you read them in such a way that you're not automatically going to get seduced by this so-called master of propaganda, right? How can you read them dispassionately in a way that can understand his argument without actually like just becoming a becoming like another version of him, right? All of these things take skills and they take education. Um, and this is perhaps also part of the reason why our elites don't want people to come into contact because they don't actually trust members of the public to have these skills. Um, because let's face it, most of them don't. Most of them would be immediately seduced by the Nazis, um, which is probably why they're so frightened about it. Am I wrong? No, no, you're not. <laughs> and, and I think that, and this is one of those kind of like myths of, and we were earlier talking about you know, kind of how the worst people in the world are essentially New England progressives, you know, which is a, a sentiment I very much share. 
and there's a, a preconception. And I think that as a, you know, as a, as a Protestant, we kind of have to, you know, own that at least part of this comes from that kind of puritanical tradition mm-hmm. where essentially education in and of itself is a good, you know, everyone should be educated. It, it is almost like an unquestionable, you know, kind of like maximum moral good. And, and to me, and maybe this is easy to say from someone who's like, oh, of course I should be as educated, but not only do the vast majority of people absorb almost nothing in their education, but it really seems like a waste of time for them. You know, and I think that what we've seen, especially with higher education is that the, the value to money has, has gotten worse and worse for the majority of people. And mm-hmm. I think, and I was talking to my, my grandfather about this, who I, you know, have a great deal of affection for, but he is a prime baby boomer, you know, born in 1948, you know, did all the things that the baby boomers did. And now is, you know, very much a kind of like red state boomer. And, and he was really a, a kind of upset with me because he was asking me, because I did go to a school where I was taught, you know, the trivium, it was a classical, you know, curriculum. And he asked me like, well, are you glad you went? And I was like, yeah, I definitely, I'm glad that I went. And he's like, well, would you send your kids there? And I'm like, yeah, I, I probably would. But, and I basically said, it's like, honestly, I, I think that that education isn't for most people, you know, like there are just a certain number of people who don't get very much from it. And it's not a moral judgment, you know, it's not me being punitive, but to be perfectly honest, the vast majority of people don't care. And I don't think they should be forced to care. Mm -hmm. I mean, this in itself comes from kind of liberal, uh, I mean, John Locke famously had this idea, didn't he? Um, but, But I mean, this is a core liberal idea right that education is your path to social and moral improvement now if you think about that that is a fundamentally egalitarian idea it's this idea that actually every single individual and you still hear politicians say this like boris johnson when he was the prime minister was always saying this he kept on saying i believe that talent is spread kind of equally among the populace and it's just uh it's just a matter of like giving people the right opportunities and they will blossom you know doesn't matter where they're from doesn't matter anything like everybody is everybody is just kind of like mozart in potential right this is something that is a deeply deeply embedded belief in our in our time um doesn't matter that the billions upon billions they've spent, for example, to equalize uh, educational results in America between racial groups have failed, right? Um, doesn't matter that no matter what happens, um, y- you don't actually see in practice what their theory says. But it, it has not stopped them at any point in the past two, 250 years to question this belief in education as the source of as the source of um kind of climbing up the ladder right um no no I'm not, I'm not saying it cannot be that and obviously there are many great men who uh managed to, to make such a climb but uh how can i put this uh probably those probably those people had it in them anyway right <laughs> like they pro- they probably uh had some like inborn talent um that uh that as you're saying most people don't have so um that's the first thing that the second thing is like what is the what is the actual purpose of education um a, a lot of people today just see it straightforwardly in terms of utility right you, you go to school you get some qualifications you get into a good college and that will give you a job. Well, that's the kind of utilitarian justification. Um, uh, you know, you, you can go a bit further back and they'll talk about social and moral improvement, which is a kind of version of the same thing. It's, a, it's still a utilitarian argument. Um, wh- whereas really the, the driving force for a lot of scholars in history has just been finding the truth. Why do you do so? You just want to find the truth. 
um, which, which doesn't actually have a uh, necessarily a utility in itself. It is just for its own sake. Um, and that idea of education for its own sake or education for um, or anything for its own sake, again, is a, is a, is a kind of anathema to our, to our current way of thinking and doing things. Um, it, it's in fact much more, more of a pure expression of what Spengler would call the Faustian spirit, right? Like, what's the point of exploring over there? It's not to find resources. It's just like, it's just because we can right because it's fun or or there is no reason i just want to do it that's why you put a flag on the moon right um and uh and and so there is that um uh, there is that uh old sense of studying for the sake of establishing what is the true what is the truth of the world um which uh i mean even in my lifetime still existed in the academy there was still an older generation of scholars, even when I was in an undergraduate, who held to that older way of thinking about education. But of course, that was, um, I don't want to sound like too socialist here, that belief in a way was a kind of luxury afforded by the old, the old way that um, universities were funded either by uh, endowments, right, or... or um, or a kind of land ownership, um, or by the government directly, i.e., they were just taxpayer funded. Um, where, whereas, of course, in our in our lifetimes, certainly here in Britain, they they made the universities a lot more, uh, uh, you know, fee paying, free market. Right? They kind of marketized the university, and so each university now needed selling points. And they made it a numbers game. They made it a, a kind of um, each university needs to recruit a certain number of students in order to stay in business. So, so, so therefore, they need to actually appeal to the widest number of people. This provides incentives that are very different from we're doing this for the sake of the truth. Uh, right, and I, I think that, and this is one of the things that I that I think that the libertarians are actually quite right on is that the the system of at least in the US of uh, in the US the the education system is a a blue patronage network you know kind of on a similar scale as the US military mm -hmm. and there's essentially an unlimited amount of money you know being pumped into these schools there's an unlimited amount of endowments essentially as you know these rich silent generations and baby boomers you know leave their entire wealth you know to these universities so you have cases like uh, Louisiana State University, where they they built a a lazy river, right, like a water park attraction, in the in the shape of their logo. At the at the tune of I think over ninety million dollars, right. Basically because they need to spend the money, you know, due to a variety of tax reasons, you know, to maintain their nonprofit status, they can't keep a certain amount of money on their books. And so in the U.S., because the way that federal loans are set up. You know, essentially you can, and if you come from a certain background, this is even easier, you can finance an education as long as you want, no matter how expensive it is. And so it's very common. And I know many people who are, you know, working jobs where they make, you know, decent money. So, you know, like 50, 60 grand a year, and they're almost $300,000 in college debt. Mm -hmm. And really this like endless cycle of, oh, just finance it with government backing, you know, so which means essentially unlimited backing, at least allegedly, has created this massive system of, of just graft. And really, no one in Washington is particularly interested in dismantling it because it's a massive patronage network. I mean, they, they are, yeah. look, I mean, you can do, you can run the numbers on how many students and how many, you know, college faculty, you know, vote red. It's almost no one. Yeah, well, I mean, because it's become an indoctrination, an indoctrination program, essentially. Um, I mean, I will say, being realist for a second, that I'm not sure if universities ever were these kind of bastions of the truth that we all like to think of, right? Um, in every in every age, um, every university has essentially kind of reproduced the official state ideology of the time. 
uh, a lot of them started out as religious. I mean, in this country, they started out as um, as religious institutions, right? Um, and you know, depending on your point of view, you might think, well, okay, they were propagating the truth of the gospel or whatever. But it, it, in fact, what they what they were really doing was, um, I mean, they have always been ideological in the way that we we might recognize today. Um, in fact, if you look at the PhD program, it's, um, you know, it's a master and apprentice system. And the PhD researcher, the, um, the, the mentor, if you want to put it that way, in theory kind of reproduces versions of themselves. Right. right. It is essentially a, a machine for producing consensus. Yes. And you reproduce, like you're also reproducing yourself. Right. I mean, um, you're, you're, you're ensuring that your intellectual legacy, um, y you know, multiplies. Um, now, this, uh, th this is the kind of social utility, I guess, of education for, for power. I guess we'd call, call it that way. Um, what interests me is that a lot of the a lot of these kind of truth seekers through history I have found have actually worked outside the academy. Like a lot of the people that you think of as being, like I mentioned Spengler earlier on. Spengler didn't work in university. He was a school teacher, kind of wrote in his spare time. Um, uh, this guy, uh, Brooks, Adam, Brooks Adams, who I've been writing on here, uh, obviously he was a child of priv privilege. You know, he, he, his family had two former presidents in it. Um, but he, he was only able to stay in the university system for seven years before he was fired, right? He was fired in um, in uh, 1910, I think, for his dangerous ideas, you know. Lasted even less in the university system than I did. <laughs> um, and, and yet he was this kind of radical free thinker. He ended up uh, influencing Theodore Roosevelt and, you know, or uh, Evelyn I'm looking at here. He did most of his work outside the academy. Um, a, a lot of a lot of the a lot of the people who truly become influential don't actually do it within the academy. They end up because they, they, they can't, they don't. They're not, um, as Jordan Peterson would say, socially agreeable. Right? They don't want to go along with the consensus. They want to break free of that. But of course, even for those men to exist, they need to have. They need to have the building blocks of the education anyway, re regardless of where they get it they're building on those fundamental skills we were talking about earlier on. So, uh, Well, and it's interesting you bring that up because the idea of an education is until very recently was essentially synonymous with being upper class. And, and you see this in kind of like the ancient Greek concept concept of leisure, right? The idea that you were wealthy enough, you know, you, you owned, the means to reduce the amount of labor required to exist on a day-to-day -day level that you could, you know, sit around and contemplate the higher things in life. And so I think that for those people who can kind of dis, like decouple their academic work from their livelihoods, you know, it, it just, it stands to reason that those will be the people who actually make, you know, real, I guess, like positive, I guess, like developments in any field because, and I think that you know this, right? Like there's a massive incentive, you know, especially if you have tons of debt, you know, essentially this giant, you know, like sword of Damocles hanging over your head to tow the party line. I, I mean, really, that's how they, they quote unquote, get, you know, the vast majority of people, right? That the consequences for noticing are just too high. Mm -hmm. And I think that you're right to point that out that to a certain degree, that isn't really a new I guess a new development. That's how humans have always worked, and I guess the problem now is that the it, it's just slanted against us. Well, the, the, yeah, the, or if you want to put it another way, the consensus engine. It's the consensus that is being reproduced is an evil one. Right. One. The problem is not consensus, and I think that yeah. this is my frustration with kind of the, the people in our fields who tend to lean, you know, more into kind of like anarchist thought, is that I, at least to me there are certain things where. I mean, there is kind of a darkness to humanity. You I mean humans do things that aren't like pleasant or nice, and I'm not really sure that you can. And this goes back to kind of like the, the 
progressive idea of education and the progressive idea of government that I, I'm not sure you can kind of educate that out of people. Obviously, there are societies that are better or worse. There are consensuses that are better or worse. But it, it does sound, it does at least to me seem to be kind of a core, I guess, human mistake in that. You see what I'm getting at? Yeah, I mean, to, to, to a certain extent, um, what we're kind of tiptoeing around, I think, is what you might call um, kind of natural aristocracy of talent or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereby no, no, matter which, no matter which social configuration you have, the, the vast majority of people are going to be uh, appeasers, right? They're going to go along with the orthodoxy and they're not going to question authority. Um, now there needs to be a certain amount of that, otherwise you don't have a society, right? You can't have an entire society of everybody questioning authority, otherwise you'd have anarchy, right? So you need to have a certain amount of people who who are like that. Um, I, I guess the um, the thing for us to think about, I guess, is if there was somebody who's a who's a natural aristocrat in that way. How, where, how are they going to develop those? How are they going to develop those good habits we were talking about earlier on? Because they still, there still needs to be some sort of cultivation, right? Um, and you know, so it's it's not like a, it's not like a purely inborn thing because obviously an environment plays a role. You know, like if Shakespeare had been born a hundred years earlier, he wouldn't have been a playwright. He would have been just like farming in the field. Or uh, I don't know, like Martin Luther say, he he, you know, this man changed history, for for better or for worse. But he he wasn't able to do that. Um, he wouldn't have been able to do that had he not been afforded that rudimentary education that he had. He made it go a hell of a long way. Um, but uh, you understand what I'm saying, right? Um, you, you know, so there does need to be some sort of balance, I would say, between um then there needs to be a mechanism to be able to allow those people who have those inborn talents um to flourish i guess um obviously the answer is not the the tony blair boris johnson answer or or the answer that the the american society has at the moment which is dragoon everybody through school and university right <laughs> uh, and maybe we'll find our geniuses that way, right? Because you're, you're now you're now actually stultifying like eighty percent, ninety percent of the people there who would probably be a lot happier and a lot more productive if they were doing something else, right? Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know exactly know what the answer is, but uh, me me providing the trivium is one is my small way of trying to trying to trying to help. With this, because I'm not convinced that you you necessarily not convinced you necessarily need to spend you know like 15 years in education or whatever it is that they make people do. Um, I mean that's another thing we might talk about as well, which is the sheer amount of time people spend in school or universities these days. Um, I mean definitely yeah. that's yeah, and it's one of the things that. I kind of use, and I don't want to say this in a, in a way that makes it sound like I spend my entire life, you know, kind of, you know, trying to, trying to break the brains of my, uh, you know, let's just say politically less sophisticated peers. But, but occasionally I, I get in a mood where I do want to hear what people really think. And so I just kind of ask questions. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm poking someone on just on essentially this, this idea of Whig history, right? The idea that, you know, line goes up for forever, you know, things are always better. Nothing can ever be as good as it is now. If you think it was better before, well, that's you can go back to like the con the, the discussion on psychologizing. But I, especially older people, I ask them like, well, okay, what was was school better or worse for you than it is now? And I know a lot of teachers. You know, my my fiance is a you know a public school teacher, a and, and so I have at least to a certain degree a decent amount of knowledge. I was in school you know pretty recently, and despite that they have in many ways either expressed or kind of tacitly expressed this idea that, oh, it's so much better now. You know, it always gets better. Almost without fail, when asked, people always say like, oh, my education was so much better than what my kids got or what my grandkids got. Mm -hmm. And 
I mean, obviously some of that's just pure, at least in the US, is just physical security. You know, you didn't have to worry about being, you know, mugged in school, you know, before about roughly 1964. But nonetheless, there is this idea that I think is really fair that in an age in which it was still possible to be a high school graduate and, and you know, maintain a stay at home wife, you know, which is allegedly that's a much lower level of education. But when you talk to the people who graduated high school in, you know, 1950, 1955, these people are more intelligent, more competent, and certainly more well-spoken than, you know, many college graduates. I, I mean, I put myself in that category. And I mean, I'm sure that you've known, like if you've talked to or watch footage of, and working class doesn't quite fit American, the American context, but like working class Brits from, you know, essentially pre-World War II, you listen to them speak and they sound incredibly put together and it's mm -hmm. shocking. And it's this, at least to me, that kind of breaks down the idea that there is a correlation between years of education and the output, right? Like, obviously there's not a direct correlation there, but nonetheless, right? There is this kind of eternal push towards, oh, go to your grad, or go to your undergrad. We well, should get a master's. We well, should really try for a doctorate, you know. And and look, obviously, for some people who really want to be kind of theoretical leaders, that might be necessarily, you know, something you have to do. But look, I'm I'm sure you know a lot of people who have you know advanced degrees and essentially nothing to show for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's uh, it it is a kind of I mean, there's another way of looking at this, which is our our fox fox like managerial elites have found a kind of kindergarten mechanism to keep all these millions of people off the books for a while. <laughs> because if you're yeah. in if you're in college, right, paying fees, regardless of how they're funded, you're not in the employment stats. I can guarantee you there's an economist somewhere who's who's thought how long and hard about that. Oh, if we can encourage this many people to do a master's degree, they won't enter the employment statistics until this point. So we can kind of offset that problem of like youth unemployment, for example. <laughs> um, well, and you see it on yeah. both ends because it, it, in the U S there's also this push first, it was everyone should go to kindergarten. You know, it was actually not particularly common when I was a kid for you to go to kindergarten. Like it was a majority opinion, but there were still quite a lot of people who didn't. Now it's, in, in all effects, essentially mandatory. And now there's this push for, you know, essentially pre-K, right? The idea that the the traditional, you know, 12 years of, you know, your, your you know, your, your uh, basic education is now expanding in both directions. And so it, it very much is kind of like leaning into, into this first third of your life is just spent, you know, with eight hours of essentially state indoctrination. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and I mean, I'll tell you something else people forget about as well, which is that um, it's the drive towards homogenization and standardization, so that everybody has to everybody has to have the same experience. Back in, the, like, say, in the Victorian era, you would have had uh, families where I don't know. I, I talk about this in one of my books, uh, "Defenders of Liberty." I, I looked into what was the actual like household income of an average family you know, coal miners, for example. And um, it used to be the case that, I don't know, let's say you've got five kids. They'd be in, they'd be working in the mine by the age of nine or 10, something like that. Uh, of course, each one of those kids in the mine would have been bringing back a paycheck. So they would have been contributing to the family. Um, this is something people forget about because a lot of those families didn't want to stop the child labor, right? But they, those kids didn't actually work five days a week. They would have paid a small fee and had a and had some sort of education at a school. It's just they weren't there five days a week, right? And so they had an arrangement that kind of worked for them. Uh, whereas uh, now you don't actually have all of those sorts of arrangements. Those alternative arrangements are, have been mandatory. You know, it's mandatory to do it the way they want it. And of course, they set the curriculum as well. On top of that, um, I think in this country, if even if you want to do homeschooling, you still have to do the same curriculum as everybody else. The same exams I'm talking about. So the actual material is kind of set from the top down. Um, so 
yeah, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't know uh, what else to say about it other than, um, other than, in all of these books I've been reading for this uh, for this book I'm writing at the moment, Prophets of Doom, they talk about centralization and homogenization as two of the, as two of the uh, driving forces of what you call entropy, civilizational entropy, right? So I just find it interesting you've picked up on that mandatory drive to put everyone in kindergarten for example because that is what you're seeing that's the production of the mass man um and by the end of that 12 15 20 year education process um they have they will have transformed that individual into being that mass man who is incapable of embodying chivalric or heroic values well, and it because they've been sitting, aligns... they've been sitting in a classroom for the past twenty years. <laughs> anyway, carry on, Jay. Sorry. It, it very much reminds me of that that first chapter in in Abolition of Man. You know, the second time I'm going to cite Lewis tonight, where he essentially goes into and just tears apart this this children's. I believe it's a would have been like a. I think it's an English textbook, and he basically describes how even you know in a, in a relatively you know, early era, I think he wrote that in the 50s, he's describing how there's this kind of like creeping homogenization and creeping, I guess, just uh, like Reddit, <laughs> like Reddit rationalism kind of creeping into the, you know, the way that children are taught. And he describes that, that this will create, you know, kind of a race of, of men without chests, you know, people who look like normal humans, but, you know, have none of the, the kind of important priors that lead to kind of virtuous people. And he specifically talks about how, well, how can you expect, you know, a man to be patriotic, you know, to die for his country, to be a brave policeman, to run into gunfire, you know, when he's been taught his entire life that, you know, well, emotions like patriotism and, well, that's just a, you know, that's just a simple chemical reaction in your brain. You know, that's, that's just emotivism. And, and so obviously he's talking about, you know, kind of the problems of modernity. You know, the problems that we still see now, we still see the, the consequences of, but we're facing different evils, which nonetheless are kind of being communicated in the same way. And the other thing that's incredibly, I guess, sinister about this is that it, you, you kind of can't win the numbers game when it comes to time with your kids. And I'm not saying you can't, it's very difficult. Right. Because look, okay, how much time does the school have with your kids? Okay, so let's just say roughly 40 hours a week, a little more, a little less. Mm -hmm. Realistically, how much time do you spend with your kids? Okay, let's assume it's and now let's just say it's another, I don't know, another 60 hours a week. We're we're speaking in generalities here. Okay, how much of that are you imparting to them values? To be very generous and say about half that, you know, because a lot of it is just kind of day-to-day things. Mm -hmm. And then it's no wonder why, and look, I, I think that we see this in kind of conservative red state culture that despite the fact that many of these, you know, these, these millennials and these, you know, zoomers had relatively conservative parents. I'm using conservative as a stand in. They got them, you know, they got them in grade school. They got them in elementary school. And certainly by the time they've gone to college, what do you expect to happen? You know, they have, they essentially have the, the tendrils so deep into their minds that look, so one of my, one of my best friends is about 40. He has four children, you know, all wonderful, great stand up guy. And, you know, just because this cost of sending your, your kid to private school, obviously public school in the UK context, it is prohibitive with four children. You know, if you don't work an incredibly high end job. So his kids go to a regular public school and it's a good public school. But nonetheless, even though the fact that, you know, he raises his kids well, you know, they go to a conservative religious community, their parents obviously don't believe these things. Their kids come home and ask questions about, you know, sex and gender stuff. And obviously, like, okay, you can defeat that. But nonetheless, that shows you kind of even in the ideal situation, you know, you're essentially letting your enemy kind of seed ideas in kids' minds. And it's no, it's no wonder that this kind of natural birth advantage that right wingers have is kind of equalized out by education yeah i mean uh, um the, the only the only very slight white pill i've got for this 
and I know they're kind of rare for me, is that um, as I've been working on this book, Jay, this uh, this Prophets of Doom book, I've come to realize that many men felt like we did now in history uh, at different times. Like, you know, I'm talking about like Vico, uh, Carlyle, this Brooks Adams, Spengler, you, know, you name it. Um, there's a chap in France called uh, Arthur de Gobineau. Uh, he had a few naughty ideas as well, but but he still kind of felt the same way, same way that we do. And one of the things I've noticed is that when men start talking like this, like like we're talking about now, they tend to they do actually gain a bit of traction. Like they're they're tapping into some primal thing that's in the ether and in a strange way because I, I think from a certain point of view it can look like history has always gone their way right that the law of entropy is real and that you know and a long enough time time horizon the left always wins right this is like Moldberg or something but, but in fact that's not really how it's gone and there are these I've started to see that it does oscillate back towards our direction for a while. It may not last, not forever, but for a while. And the catalyst is always men talking in the way that we're talking right now, because it shows that it shows that somebody's recognizing it. But of course it takes a few great men, right? It takes a few small select few people to make those changes. Never the, it never happens like uh, as a mass phenomenon, if that makes any sense. It usually starts with a few people talking that way, and then they will actually implement the things that need to happen for the, you know, I hate to talk about them in this way, but for the NPC that you're worried about here, right? Uh, well, and I should yeah. clarify, I, I do have yeah. people from time to time telling me I, I, I'm black billed and, and I'm genuinely not, because I, I take your point. And if you had to ask me, well, do you think that the next 15 years are going to be, are we going to win in 15 years? No. Are we going to win in my lifetime? Maybe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not convinced. But as far as kind of like the fate of, you know, human civilization, I, I have a relatively rosy view of it. You know, I think that, you know, many of these ideas are, incredibly self-destructive. And the question is not like, oh, will this plunge us into, you know, a 10,000 year technocratic Reich? I'm not convinced of that. But if you ask me the question of like, well, are things going to get quite unpleasant for us? I'm convinced of that. And, and mm -hmm. so I don't want people to read into this saying like, oh, it's all hopeless because there are solutions. Like if you can send your kids to a private school, specifically one that teaches, you know, kind of this, this, this Western canon, do it, you know, make sacrifices. You know, my, my parents did and it was well worth it. Like, look, I'm here. You know, I, I really shouldn't be here by numbers alone. You know, I, I met someone like Bagby in school, which I, again, I shouldn't have. And so there yeah. are places you can get away from it. And if you can make those sacrifices either in time, you know, when it comes to homeschooling your kids, which is great. I mean, lady in chat is talking about it. Or if you can send your kids to a, a school, like there are places to go. I guess I just, I wanted to say that there is a these are all decisions that should be made carefully because if you do believe that, you know, the ideas that we have are not just theoretically correct, you know, like it would be nice if my, you know, progeny believed this, but kind of have a real material bearing on your life, you know, this will, th then these are sacrifices that I, I think are worth making. And look, I, I say this as someone without, without children, right. But mm -hmm. it, it seems to me at least like it theoretically follows. I mean, my, one of the things I've come to, to to see, I guess, is that there inevitably has to be whether whether elites like it or not, right? There inevitably has to be a swing back our way, um, and the reason for that is because I, I think Bronze Age pervert used this phrase, and I think it's a useful one. Our enemies try to deny something like half of all of life, right? They call it. They just call it fascist or something, right? It's like forbidden over there. But all, that half of life cannot, cannot actually be cancelled. We're talking about like beauty, heroism, vitality, truth, capital T, truth, 
transcendence, all of these things that drive the likes of like all of these kind of feelings that people can't quite articulate drive us all to be in spaces like this, to have this sort of conversation or like the friendship between you and Bagby or whatever else. Um, the biggest propagandist machinery the world's ever seen, this machine that we've just been talking about, couldn't kill it in all of us. So, of course, it's going it, to, it has, there is, it's like um, they're not going to be able to stop it rearticulating itself somehow, right? It will come back. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, we're saying that the indomitable human spirit can be defeated. I mean, it can be held down. I'm not sure if it can be defeated forever. So that's why, that's, that, yeah, that's that, that's a kind of another way of putting what we were talking about. Yeah. That, that's well said. And, and I think that, and maybe this is a an overly theological way to view this. But but if you view that there is, or if you believe that there is an, an objective state to the universe, uh, we don't have to get into, can we ever observe it? But if you believe that there is kind of a material reality that we must index ourselves with, then obviously, you know, any of these kind of like ways of organizing people will produce different results. And I realize that's simple, but that, that, that means that obviously if these kind of different ways of organizing ourselves produce different results, that if you do something as drastic as essentially carving out half of human experience, you're going to produce a bad society. And just because of the fact that, you know, resources are limited, you know, even if, if you don't course correct, someone else will stop making that mistake and take it away from you. Mm -hmm. So to me, I, I like the example of, of Lysenkoism. Right, that you can believe however much you want, you know, that there is a, you know, a, a, essentially a communist or a socialist way to grow plants, you know, that maybe, you know, if, if you put all of the, you know, the, the different crops together in an ideal circumstance, they will grow together cooperatively, but well, the plants don't care. And, and so obviously my point is not that there is a direct correlation between winning and being right. That's not my point. My point is that because essentially power is a zero sum game. You can only play badly so long before you, you know, you lose everything and you're kicked out of the table. Yes, exactly. Um, and it comes, it comes out in all sorts of weird ways, right? All sorts of weird ways. Um, like, I mean, I know this is cartoonish, but like the, the figure of Putin on the bare chest on the back of the bloody horse versus, um, versus the, you know, the literally the tr tranny U.S. general. Uh, was she an admiral in the admiral in the navy or something? No, it's not even the uh, navy. It's like a weird appointed admiralship. I can't even remember yeah. what Levine is actually technically what her rank is. Like his uh, that's a confusing thing. What that person's rank is. But the li the li I guess what I'm saying is the lizard brain brain knows right. The lizard brain knows. You you can put. Uh, bloody Lizzo on the on the billboard as long as you want the lizard brain still knows what beauty is what the you know they they're not going to be able to um, essentially uh, replace natural hierarchy um, with this system which artificially tries to promote uh, what is ugly what is what is conventionally been at the bottom of the hierarchy for extremely good reasons right i mean i'm i mean i'm talking everything like um th th there's been a big bid to put like disabled disabled people on television and so on and it's like as polite as everybody wants to be the lizard brain the, the lizard brain still knows and as long as that's the, as long as that's the case um there will be a snapback at some point uh and hopefully it will be such a brutal and violent uh snapback uh that uh, you know, it'll be a thousand years before <laughs> before they try this bullshit again. Let's hope, eh? Well, and one of the things that I think you see this lizard brain, I guess, instant recognition of hierarchy, is if you've been to you know university and you've seen the, the kids there who are so obviously there because of affirmative action, 
like look like there were there were plenty of kids who had you know certain ethnic backgrounds who seemed like they belonged there right like they're bright kids fair enough and then there were the other ones where you're like oh i know why you're here everyone knows why you're here and it was so immediately apparent that they were just not of the required caliber mm. and i think all of us have that you know and that doesn't necessarily mean because people recognize it that means we win this election but nonetheless i think there is there is something to be hopeful there so i, I looked this up just because i wanted to check this is actually even more uh <laughs> comical than you think if you had to guess what is rachel levine an admiral of just the most most comical thing you could think of to be I both an was, admiral i thought it was just the navy what, what is oh what, no no <laughs> it's uh it is <laughs> the united states public health service has an admiral <laughs> All right, Admiral of the Public Health Service. Is it? I mean, <laughs> I guess you get to wear a uniform. Uh, there's a common refrain I use on on my Telegram or you know on my Twitter that I just want to remind people of that, that there is something to take comfort in the fact that our our enemies are profoundly embarrassing people. Like like you look at someone like Lenin and say what you will about him. You know Lenin, Stalin, these kind of like you know arch you know like demons of the left. Whatever you say about them, they're not embarrassing people. You know, they're competent. They're ruthless. They were men of vitality. And then you look at Rachel Levine and you're like, oh, you are a, yeah. just a, a shambling homunculus. Yeah. And uh, or, or, or Biden, who's a very good avatar of the American order at the minute. Right. I, I mean, I honestly think that it, there, there's some wisdom in that idea that you, you sort of get the leaders you deserve. And I look at Biden, I'm like, yeah. It, I mean, if you wanted kind of a, an emblem of the American empire, that's pretty close to it. I mean, what's interesting to me at the moment, um, I don't want to drift too far from from education, uh, um, Jay, and I know, I know you want to wrap up in a minute, but uh, it, it, it seems like um, it seems like around the world, people are genuinely crying out for a higher quality of leader. Uh, I mean, I was I, I struggled to look at those images from Brazil the past few week, few days. And I thought if 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 Bolsonaro was a different caliber of man, you know, he would have grabbed, he would have seized this moment, right? If he was Lenin, he would have seized the moment, let's face it. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, Bolsonaro didn't have the, the, I mean, they're still out on the streets now, but they didn't have the, re, the you know, he didn't have the, the necessary sprib, spirit to grab the moment. Um, but the... The feeling is there. I, I think it's only going to intensify as um, as these people get worse and worse. Um, and as the drive towards things that are frankly impossible, like net zero carbon and all this sort of stuff, um, gets more and more intense. You know, I mean, 2030 is eight years away. Um, so I, I, I actually am more and more thinking that the, the change could be more rapid than we, than, than we imagine. Um, as they as they get more and more draconian in their you know in their kind of zombie march towards this climate thing that they're trying to do um one way or the other they're gonna get you know they're gonna lose uh either by the foreign power who says no uh which let's face it it's gonna be china or india one of these one of these um or just internally where, where people is like you know you know, I, I'm not going to pay five pounds to leave zone A to go to zone B and another five pounds to go to zone C and another five pounds to go to zone D to do a 20 mile journey to the nearest city. You know, uh, maybe I don't want to do that. Um, and so, uh, you know, they may have bitten off more than they they can chew. Um, but it, it it's going to you know, it won't be pretty as we've as we've talked about, but uh I don't know. I, I feel in more and more that the change is going to come. It is going to come sooner rather than later. Let's hope. Well, well, I very much, I very much hope you're right. One of the things that I I want to say, just to kind of circle back around, and we can you know lead this into you know plugging your uh, your courses again. But but I want to encourage people that the kind of classical education that built the West. I mean, it's easy to look at this, and I even say this as like someone who considers himself still very, you know, uneducated on certain topics. That this is something that, for the vast majority of people, they did themselves. I mean, obviously, you had a school teacher, but 
the process of education was much more primary sources. You read. And so obviously, would it have been better if you had been, you know, an 18th century aristocrat with a private tutor who went to the, you know, most prestigious university in the world? Well, yes, it would have been. You know, but but barring that, this is something that you can reproduce in yourself. And if you if you really do want to kind of become an aristocrat, you know, or adopt aristocratic tendencies, then, you know, the, the type of education that is still out there, you know, the, these great primary sources are, are, are not only available to you because of the internet, but also like, these are things that were taught to children, you know, and so you can both teach them to your own children and teach them to yourself. Mm-hmm. And, and so to me, there is kind of a hope in that, that the, the, the tool by which our enemies, you know, hope to ensnare us and, and <laughs> to a certain degree really have ensnared us it is also kind of our, you know, the thing that will, you know, throw them off our backs to a certain degree. Like it's never been easier really to find the kind of things they don't want you to read. You know, it's not like you only have your local library. And I realize, look, Zleb just got taken down by the DOJ the other day, but there are still plenty of sources. And so, sorry. Yeah, ar- ar- archive.org is a good one. You know, tons of old books on there. That's that's a good resource. I've used that. I used to <laughs> pirate my uh, my uh, textbooks off of there. But uh, there, there are lots of great resources. And so before we get into, you know, final plugs and, and uh, you know, uh, wind this thing down, I do have two super chats. Uh, QWERTY Z7 for $5 Canadian, which I think comes out to about a dollar American. Uh, <laughs> did Jay Burden get AA to show up on time? AI deepfake PSYOP stream. That's, of course, true. Uh, all of my guests are just me doing a silly voice in another microphone. Uh, none of these are real. It's just me talking to myself. I am, I'm always on time, and uh, unless a certain co-host of mine happens to be on the show, in which case we'll be about 15 minutes late. So. As someone who has also been on your shows, I can confirm that's actually true. Uh, and then Marshall Forward for $2 American. Based burden in AA. Dope. Well, thank you very much. And before we get out of here, do you want to plug anything, AA? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things I'll say is that even if you do go to university, the number one lesson that you learn in university is that I would say 90% of all the best learning you do is the stuff you do yourself. And a good university will teach you how to teach yourself, if that makes any sense. Um, the uh, And the second thing I'll just say is, remember, if you're going to get a course at the agency, you might as well get the money off uh, promo code MERIT. M E R I T merit. I will get you a twenty five percent off at the moment for uh, for this month. So there you go. All right, guys. And as far as my plugs go, obviously this show is available on YouTube uh, for the new people who are here to CAA. I have a you know at this point a pretty significant backlog of different interviews you know, with other figures from the circle. Recently, I've talked to to Thomas, to Prude, you know a few other big names. Uh, the show is also available on Apple, uh, Spotify, any one of the you know normal podcatchers you use to listen to audio shows. And the scheme I've got worked out is addition to kind of like the basic, you know, websites like, uh, like Buy Me a Coffee or Subscribestar, which I really do appreciate. After kind of the initial or the most recent 10 episodes, the audio shows go behind a paywall on my Substack, and you can listen to them, all of them for just the basic, you know, $5 donation level. Again, I realize it's not a huge thing but it's a way to offset the, the cost of the show. And so anyway, is there anything you want to say a before we wrap this thing up? No, just uh, thanks for having me. And uh, um, I will be, uh, I'll be back tomorrow night to do unpopular opinions. We'll be looking at the, uh, the midterm. So join us for that. All right. And I realize there's actually one thing I should say. I will be over on Yiz's channel on her show, Discord and Dragons, which I believe is an Odyssey exclusive tonight with uh, Oro's post. I don't know what we're going to be talking about, but it should be a good show. I like both of those guys. And uh, I hope to see you guys there. And uh, remember, guys, keep your head up. The lie can't last forever. Good night.